Open your Bibles, if you would, please, to 1 Kings chapter 17. 1 Kings chapter 17. We're in the life of the prophet Elijah, this burly mountain man who burst on the scene and comes into the throne room of King Ahab. And he is coming out of a land of obscurity from a little small village, And it's like all of a sudden, a person who nobody knows, now everybody knows. He has been chosen sovereignly of God to be the standard that will rise up at this particular time. You know, God said, and he gave us a promise, and this ought to encourage all of our hearts. He said, when you see wickedness coming in like a flood into the land, Be encouraged because he said, I will raise up a standard against it. And I believe God is doing that. Maybe it won't be another Elijah. Maybe it'll be a lot of Elijahs. But there is a standard that God is raising up. And of course, for us, the standard is the cross. So in 1 Kings chapter 17, we're going to begin at verse 8 because when we left off, Elijah had, after he delivered the message that God wanted Ahab to hear, and that is that because of the national calamity, the nation for king after king after king after king had gone into the pursuits of idolatry and political intrigue and had gone in the way of corruption, and the nation had just turned from God. As a matter of fact, in that day, I'm sure many people thought Jehovah God was dead. In every generation, there's always some so-called intellectual who wants to come along and tell us that God is dead. But God doesn't exist. And so for the kingdom of Israel, that's how they viewed it. That's how they thought it would be true. One thing you need to know that as long as Israel lasted as a nation, those top ten tribes that had split after the death of Solomon, that there was never, ever, not one righteous king. Not one. God sent them prophet after prophet But there was never a righteous king to call the nation back to holiness. And the nation continued to slide into spiritual decline until finally God allowed the Assyrians to come and to take them into captivity. And so God is patient. God is merciful. God had given years and years and years of chances to turn. He had sent them voices of the prophets giving his word, calling them to repentance, and yet it never happened. And sometimes that can be really discouraging. And Elijah is called to a task that is very dangerous because King Ahab and his wife the queen, Jezebel, she was vicious. And she was a person who could have you killed at a moment's notice. So after he delivered the message that by my word there will be no rain in the land until I say neither will there be dew on the ground. And after he gave that message, God said, now go and go east and go over to the tributary called Kareth that runs into the Jordan. And there I want you to stay there. And there I want you to just be out of the limelight. I want you to be in a hidden place, in a quiet place. Sometimes God puts us in hidden places. Sometimes God puts us in the secret place, the quiet place, in order for us to grow and meditate and develop spiritually. We don't develop spiritually in the hustle-bustle of life. We don't 
really mature. We don't really become all that God wants us to be in all of the daily grind of life. That only occurs when we have the moments of solitude. And sometimes when we don't take the moments of solitude, God puts us in a place of solitude. Because it's in that place we meet the living God. It's in that place we get a chance to think through some of the issues of life. It's in that place that we find the meaning and purpose that God has for us and the destiny that God has called us to. And so it's at by the brook Kareth. And he said, I am going to send you fresh meat and <clears throat> you are going to be fed bread and meat twice a day and I will send ravens to do that. Now I think this is an interesting thought that God would send ravens because in the book of Deuteronomy, God says have nothing to do with ravens. Ravens are unclean. So don't have anything to do with it. They're scavengers. And yet God commanded ravens, the very thing He commanded the people not to have anything to do with, He commanded them to take care of His prophet. And the prophet probably thought, now wait a minute, I'm getting fed God's provision is coming through something that God has declared to be unclean. Folks, here's a few of the lessons I think we can get out of this. One of those lessons is that God can use hell to bring heaven to us. Don't despise God's methods. Don't put God in a box to where that you declare God can do this but not that. God might just surprise you. God might just use the most unlikely person to bring a blessing to you. Sometimes we are confused by the method that God uses. Listen, if God wants to use the unclean to bless the clean, who are we to say he can't do that? I'm, I'm reminded of the story I may have told you about the lady who was always a widow lady. She was just always praising God, praising a hallelujah, thank God. Everything was just a time of praise and how God always took care of her and how God always provided for her and she was just always praising the Lord. I mean, no matter what happened in her life, she was just praising God. One guy got tired of listening to it, and he was an agnostic, and he just said, you know, I'm going to prove to her that God just doesn't exist. And she was a lady who was without much means, so he bought a bunch of food and groceries and sacks, and he put it on her front porch, rang the doorbell, and then he hid in the bushes. She opened the door, saw all the groceries there, and she was saying, thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord. God provided. He jumped out and said, God didn't have anything to do with it. I bought those, and I brought them there and put them on your doorstep just to show you that God doesn't exist. That was for me, not God. She reared back and said, oh, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. God, you've met my need, and you even let the devil bring it. You know, <clears throat> God can use anything. And if he needs to use an unclean bird to take care of a prophet, hey, don't despise God's methods. Sometimes when it comes to churches, you know, churches all have different ways of doing things. But you know, sometimes we may be a little critical of some people, the way they worship or the way they do things. Listen, let's not... Put God in a box. Let's not say it all has to be just one way. When we worship God, we worship Him in spirit and in truth. And if it doesn't violate that, then I think God's okay with it. Now, we come to the passage where the brook dries up and the ravens aren't showing up. And the prophet is sitting there thinking, now what? But God had commanded Elijah to stay there until he commanded him to leave. Now, he could have just got up and said, well, 
everything's kind of quit. It's time to move on. I think I'll just head back over here or head over there. No, he did not. He waited until God said go. And this is the thing we have to learn over and over again is that too often we want to take our situation into our own hands and we want to do something to fix something, but we don't stop long enough to say, God, what do you want? What should I do? Where should I go? We just think about it, we like this, and we do it. That may not be God's will. And so, verse 8 of chapter 17, then, <laughs> when, then. Well, when's the then? The then was when everything was dried up. The then was when the ravens quit flying in with sandwiches. That was the then. Then the word came. Listen, sometimes folks, God waits until there are no other resources. And it's then he speaks to us. God is, as I've said many times, he's passed up a lot of opportunities to come early, but he's never late. He's an on-time God. Always on time. Not your time, his time. And so as Elijah's sitting there saying, now what? It was then, kind of that last moment, it was then God spoke. And what did the word of God tell him to do? Well, verse 9 tells us, he said, Arise and go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow to feed you. Now, let's kind of bring this together a little bit. First of all, go to Zarephath. Now, Zarephath is what we would call modern-day Lebanon. It would be in the north. It would be above Galilee. It was a Gentile region. Not only that, but Zarephath was like the capital of Baal worship, and Jezebel was from that area. So God is sending his prophet into the Baal belt. We live in the Bible belt, but where God was sending Elijah was to the Baal belt. Now, Baal was in charge of rain and fertility and all that sort of thing. And of course, God was challenging Baal head on, and he was closing up the heavens, and there was no rain, and all the prayers to Baal were going nowhere. God was challenging their gods. Listen, God will do that. <coughs> Anything you put your faith or trust in other than Him, God will challenge it. God will shake it. Whatever it is. And that's what He's doing right now. He is challenging everybody's faith in Baal. As they pray to Baal to send rain, no rain is coming. Why? Because Elijah, whose name means Jehovah is my God, he is the one who has prayed, and in the name of that Jehovah that he serves, the God of Israel, no rain is coming. It is a direct affront to the pagan god Baal. So here he is in Zarephath. Now Zarephath, the word itself, means furnace. It was a place of smelting where they would heat up the ore and separate the metal from the dross. It was a place where ironworks were taking place, a smelting place. And so God sends Elijah to a place of the furnace. I mean, if it was bad in Kareth, it's going to get really bad now because he's stepping it up. Why? Because God is taking his prophet to the next level. You know, sometimes God will want to move us to the next level. But he can't take us and bump us up to the next level until we have passed the first level. 
The first level was the brook of Kareth, and there he learned that God could take care of him. Now God is going to send him right into the heart of enemy territory, right into the capital of Baal worship, and there he says, I have commanded a Gentile widow to take care of you. Now that doesn't make sense on its face because widows were notoriously poor. There was not social underpinning like we have here today. There was not a network of societal uh, finance to take care of widows. Widows were totally dependent on the goodness of those around them to live. So, when God said move, Elijah said, then move I will. And he obeyed the voice of the Lord and he headed north right up into the heart of Baal worship. Now, I'm sure the question came to his mind, well, how will I know which widow it is that I'm supposed to meet? Because I'm sure there's a lot of widows. And there were. You remember, Jesus referred to this situation when he talked to some of the people in his own hometown. And he made the statement, he says, now I want you to know that a prophet doesn't receive any honor in his own hometown. But he said, think of this. He said, in the days of Elijah, God sent Elijah to a widow, a Gentile widow in the north. There were many widows in Israel, but he sent her to a widow of the Gentiles. And even more so, there were many lepers in Israel. But God sent the prophet to a Gentile general, Naaman, and healing was brought. And the Bible says that his citizen folk who lived with him rose up in absolute anger and they were going to push him over the cliff. And he walked through them and they, they just lost sight of him. Why were they so angry? Because Jesus was teaching that not just Jews are cared for by God. That God cares for the non-Jew as well. And that God sent Elijah and the prophet to both Gentile, a widow and a general, and brought relief to both of them. But he passed up so many in Israel that he could have done the same thing for. That's why they were so mad. Because he was elevating the status of Gentiles. And they didn't like that because they considered Gentiles as dogs, unclean, outside the covenants of God. So therefore, they're outside God's favor. And Jesus said, that's not true. God cares for everyone. Regardless of race, creed, or color, God loves every one of His creation. And so, Elisha, Elijah goes to Zarephath. He goes up there into what is today modern-day Lebanon. He comes into town. He's wondering who this lady is going to be, which widow. And he sees a widow picking up sticks. Now, this is an interesting thing. This lady is so poor, she doesn't have firewood. She has to go and gather sticks. Now, there was a famine of food, to be sure, but there wasn't a famine of wood. But she was so poor that she couldn't afford firewood. So the only firewood she could get was what she could pick up off the ground. And she was picking it up. Now, how did he know she was a widow? Because in that culture, widow women wore certain garb that would be easily recognized as belonging to a widow. Her clothing said, I am a widow. And he comes up to her and he says, would you please get me a drink of water? 
And she says, yes, I'll do that. And as she goes to turn to get him a glass of water, he says, and by the way, bring me a little meal cake. She stops. And this really, this really takes the cake. <laughs> she says, listen, you need to understand something. She says, um, I only have enough oil in a little jar and enough meal in a pot to make a cake for me and my son. And after that, we're going to die. We have no, nothing else left. Now, Elijah does something extremely strange here. I mean, it is something that you talk about heartless, it seems. He says, don't be afraid. Do as I have said. Bring me a little something to eat. Notice the key word, first. First. And afterward, afterward, you and your son will have plenty to eat because thus saith the Lord, your meal pot will never run dry and your jar of oil, olive oil, that you use to mix it up with, said, that will not run dry either. You'll have enough out of both of those to eat until it rains. On the day that God sends rain, then it will be empty. Now, some people might say, well, then why didn't God just fill up a great big pot full of meal and a great big jar full of oil? Why didn't he just, why was it always just enough for the next meal and no more? Just enough for the next meal and no more. Just enough for the next meal. And no more. Well, if she'd had big pots of meal and big jars of oil, don't you imagine the word would have got out in the community, hey, this lady is flush. And there might have been some scoundrels who had tried to break in, who had tried to steal it, who had tried to, you know, who knows. But maybe there's a higher reason. Maybe the reason God gave her enough in her meal pot and in her oil jar, because he wanted her to know that he was going to be her supply and that she was not to look at how much she had, but she would had to look to the source of what she had. Sometimes we want to mix it up and we want to look at the gift instead of the giver of the gift. We want to look at our resource instead of the source. And we need to understand that God is our source. Your job is not your source. Your bank account is not your source. Your employer is not your source. God is your only source. Everything else is a resource. And so, God wants us to depend totally on Him. And to live by faith. Living by faith means we don't live by what we see. We don't live by what we hear. We don't live by what circumstances may look like. That doesn't determine how we live. What determines how we live is what God said in His Word because His Word and His promises are more real than what you can see or hear. Circumstances can change just like that because God is the God of circumstances. He is your source. Everything else is a resource. And he was teaching her that he is enough for every need in every situation. And so, <clears throat> he gives her this word. But he says, go first and make 
a cake for me. Now, I thought about this. I've heard of predatory fundraising, but that seems to be about the top right there. Doesn't that sound like it to you? I've heard of preachers who can just pile on the guilt when it comes to giving. I call it predatory fundraising. I heard about a pastor just recently. You may have read the article. He was berating his congregation because they did not buy him that big expensive watch he thought he ought to get. And then he gets up and he's just lambasting his congregation and says, am I not worth your Wendy's money? Am I not worth your McDonald's money? Am I not? You know, he's going on all shaming them and everything because they didn't buy the watch that he told them he wanted. I'm sitting there saying, God, deliver us. No wonder people. People read a story like that. And of course, stories like that always make the headlines. People read that and they have a tendency to think, well, that's just the way it is. People are always wanting your money. There are hirelings and there are shepherds. Obviously, this guy's a hireling. And you read this and you say, wow, Elijah, that takes a lot of brass to be able to tell her, feed me first. Now, let me give you a principle here. The principle is this. God wants to be in first place in all things. How many of you would agree with that? Does he deserve to be first in your life? Does he deserve to be first in everything that belongs to you? In this Old Testament scriptures, God said that when your harvest begins to come in, go out in the field and find the first fruits of your harvest. Those grains or those fruits that are just coming in. And take that and offer it to me. He said, give me first. Why? Because when you give the first, when you give the best, God is then freed up to bless the rest. Folks, I want to tell you, it works, it works, it works. Many of you know this to be true. That when you give God the first and the best, God promises that He will always bless the rest. There is a blessing on living by faith. And this widow woman was called upon to live by faith. She was thinking suicide by starvation. But all of a sudden, the prophet of God planted the word into her heart. And something rose up in her that received this word from the Lord and said, I believe this. Listen, when you come to the end of life, your priorities change. What you think are so, the things that are so important now, when you're looking at the end of life, your priorities take a whole different view of you. You look at things different. I've talked to people on their deathbeds many times, and I've had them say to me, you know, all of this stuff that I thought was so important, I look at it now and I'm saying, I wasted a, sh a, a lot of time trying to accumulate. <laughs> now I'm going to. Leave it. It, it. There's other things I should have invested my life in. And so, this lady, her perspective is changing. Why? Because she is receiving the word from Elijah as the word from the Lord. You see, God said, I have commanded a widow lady there to take care of you. Now, she doesn't say anything about you know I had a dream I had a vision no she didn't mention it she was going to starve and die 
Well, then how did God command her to take care of Elijah? Because when she heard the word of Elijah, she believed it as the word of God. This pagan Gentile woman who's facing death, she reaches out for the word of God and clings to it as her hope. The Bible says faith comes by what? Hearing, Romans 10, 70. Hearing what? The word of the Lord. She heard the word of the Lord and she said, I receive that. I will do that. You see, it's one thing to talk faith. It's another thing to walk faith. Many people can talk the talk But when it really comes down to it, they can't act on faith. This woman not only heard the Word, but she acted upon it. Now let me share the principle with you. When you hear the Word, God's Word, a promise to you, and you act on that Word, that promise to you from God, God will honor His Word. The Bible says His Word is a shield about me. His faithfulness is my guard and protection. God is always, always faithful to His Word. Be sure it's a Word from God that you can claim. And she did. And she went. And she made that cake. I'm sure she looked at her son while she was making it. And she kept saying to herself, I believe God. I believe God. I believe God. It would have been so easy for that mother's heart to say, ah, forget you, and make a last meal for her son and herself. But there was something that God had stirred up in her that she believed the Word And God always honors His Word. And so here in the middle of Baal worship, here in the place of the furnace, there is now a separating of the ore from the dross. This woman's life. At Kareth, Elijah learned that God would take care of him At Zarephath, Elijah learned that God would use him to take care of others. And he stayed with her all this time because God said, you stay there. You stay there. Now, I'm going to give you four points that I hope will help you and then we will close our message today. Because I see Elijah going through four tests. So if you have your notebooks out and your pencils, pens, jot these down. The first test that Elijah had was the test of leaving the familiar to the unknown. The test of leaving the familiar for the unknown. He had not been to Zarephath. He'd probably heard about it. Most Jews didn't travel to Gentile lands. And so for him, this was an act of obedience to an unknown place. How many of you have ever moved from a known place, your family, your home, whatever, and you've moved to an unknown place? You've just rooted up and moved maybe across country and you went to this new place. How many of you feel like that uh, that has happened to you maybe once or more than once? You know the feeling? You're packing up your stuff. You're going to a place. You're wondering, will I find friends there? Will there be a church there? Will, there be, will this be good for my kids? Was there a good school there? Are there good restaurants there? (laughs) So he is going to an unknown place. He is being pulled out of his comfort zone. That's the first test. He's there. And God says, when you get there, stay there. How many of you have ever been a place where you didn't want to stay after you got there? 
can be very frustrating and humbling when God says, now that you're here, stay here. But Lord, I don't, <laughs> I don't want to stay here. Stay there. Lord, I'd like to go to someplace else. God says, stay there. God, yeah, you know, um, I don't like this job. Stay there. Lord, I really don't like my neighbors. Stay there. <laughs> Lord, I'm not too happy in my marriage. Mm -mm. Stay there. Lord, I'm tired of my church. I got hurt. God says, stay there. It can be very frustrating when you're in a job, a relationship, or situation, you're ready to go, and God says no. Stay there. So the first test was the test of leaving the familiar for the unknown. Think about how difficult that was for this prophet of God. First of all, he was to go and meet a woman. In that culture, that's not easy. Not only is he supposed to go and meet a woman, but second of all, he's going to meet a Gentile woman. For a Jewish man, that is doubly difficult. And third, he's going to meet a Gentile woman who is a widow of all things. That meant that when he found her, she by definition was going to be very poor. I mean, his prospects here weren't looking real good, but that's what God said. And then not only that, but he says, when you get there, stay there. Whew. The second test that he had to face was the test of not going by what you see. What he saw wasn't good. He saw a pagan city. He saw Baal idols, altars all over the place. He saw this Gentile lady picking up sticks. She couldn't even afford firewood. And so in verse 9 and 10, he says, Go at Zarephath, stay there. I've commanded a widow to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath. He came to the town gate, and there was this widow. Sometimes if you go by what you see, you will just turn around and leave. Isn't that right? Sometimes um, things just don't look good. You say, hey, I'm going to the promised land. Yay, I get there and boo. You know, Abraham, he was called to leave Ur of the Chaldees and go to the promised land. He gets to the promised land, and guess what? There's a famine. Well, whoop de doo welcome home. Huh? So he moves to Egypt. Things just don't always work out like we think they are. You say to yourself, my job stinks, and my boss is a jerk. I'm going to get a new job. And lo and behold, you do get a new job. You think you've just entered the promised land, but your new boss is twice the jerk your old boss was. You say, I'm sick of this house. I'm going to buy me a new house. And you do. You buy a new house, and you think everything is good until it rains, and you realize that the foundation is cracked, the basement is flooded, and so there's a famine in the promised land. You leave your new church, your old church, for a new church, and you get there and you find out, well, it has problems too, and they've got a few jerks that sit in the pews. What do you do? You just found there's a famine in the promised land. I remember when Marilyn and I were going to uh, move to Chattanooga, we went down, oh, a month or so early. We looked all over for an apartment. We found a really nice apartment over on the other side of the Tennessee River, and we thought, oh, this is nice. The lady that owned it, she seemed to be a fairly nice lady. We gave her a check for a deposit, all that good stuff. So we're headed for the promised land. Now we're just a few days from school starting, and so we pack up what little bit we owned. <laughs> we owned so little I didn't even need a trailer. 
that old Chevrolet, I was able to get everything. Of course, back then, cars were about twice as big as they are today. But anyway, I was able to get everything in the trunk in the back seat. And we just had, we had everything we owned in that one car. We drove down there. <laughs> we, I walked out. I, I was coming up onto the porch. I was getting ready to open up to our new apartment. And this lady shows up. I'm sorry, I can't rent this to you. What? No, I'm sorry, I can't rent it. I've changed my mind. I'm not renting it at all. I have a daughter. I think she may want to come, so I'm just not renting. Uh, you know, where they have phones, you could have called us. You could have said, hey, this isn't working out. I mean, you waited until we got here to tell us what kind of... Man, there were all kinds of emotions going through me at that time, none of which were good none of which were God-honoring. All the things I wanted to say to her, I didn't. Some people say, well, you might as well say it. God knows what's on your mind anyway. Uh, let me give you a little truth here. Just because you're thinking it doesn't mean you ought to say it, because saying it can bring a lot more pain than thinking it. Somebody ought to say amen right there because I'm surely not the only one who's had this battle. I came out to the car and Marilyn's sitting there and said, what happened? I said, we're homeless. <laughs> you should have seen the look on her face. <clears throat> and then, of course, what happens next? Waterworks. Tears. I wasn't crying. I was just mad. And I'm looking up at God and I'm saying, God, we're coming down here to train to serve you. Can't you do a better job than this? How many of you have ever gotten angry at God? Again, I, I get lonely up here. I feel like I'm the only sinner in here. But... Uh, <laughs> So uh, we stopped and got a newspaper. We opened the newspaper and we started looking under the apartment section. We found an address that looked kind of promising. We drove to that address. It's August. It's hotter than blazes. We <clears throat> I get out and I'm looking at the house here on the side of the street nobody's home. I come back, get in the car, and there's this old lady. Isn't it amazing how God uses the women in the Bible? This old lady's at her mailbox. She says, honey, can I help you? I love being down south, you know. If you wasn't in the south, you'd be embarrassed. You know, you're called sweetie honey, you know, and everything else, and you think, you don't even know. But anyway, that's okay. Because I lived in the north for a while, and I get called a few other things. So, you know, I like sweetie and honey. That's okay. And uh, I said, and I don't know why, I just spilled it all out. Told her the whole problem. And uh, told her about my wife, all upset. We're trying to find an apartment. School's going to be starting here in just a few days. God's led us, but look at, the, look at us. You know, in the situation. So I'm... Uh, I'm having a little pity party right there on the side of the road, and this lady, this older lady, <laughs> she's in her 80s, she says, Honey, why don't you get your darling wife and you all come up to the house? She said, We've got some fresh lemonade and some ice cream. I think you could use some. I said, oh, I, I don't, I've got to find it. She said, no, you need, come on up. So we drove up the hill up to her house, and her husband, I'll never forget his name, O.Y. Smith. She told me, now his name is O.Y., as in oyster. How can you forget a name like that, okay? And uh, he was sitting there, and she got us, sitting on the porch, the breezeway, screened in, had a little breeze going, 
brought out the biggest bowl of ice cream, strawberries, had a big uh, lemonade. I mean, you know, and I'm sitting there saying, it's pretty good, it's pretty good. We sat there and ate a while. She says, now, you all don't need to be uh, driving around all over this city. Why don't you sit there and get some, some apartment things written down, and then you can do that tomorrow. <clears throat> Where are you staying? I said, well, we're staying a little old, I guess we'll pick out a little old hotel over here we passed. No, you're not. No, I'm not? No. You're staying with us tonight. Now, here's people, what, I've just met them within the hour. They don't know me. I don't know them. They didn't look like serial killers, and I don't think my wife and I did it. But she, they just out. You see what God is doing? And we did. Marilyn and her played the piano and laughed, and we ate some more good old southern food, and I'm, I'm thinking, hmm, God, what are you up to? I knew I was in the will of God. I knew I was <laughs> in the promised land. And there's a famine in the land. And we did. We remained friends with them for a long time. And we circled all these apartments. We, were going, we, got, we mapped out the whole next day. Marilyn had to go on campus. She had to take a, some kind of a test. While I was on campus, I bumped into somebody and and I said, uh, do you know uh, where this address is? I'm looking for an apartment. He said, are you a student? I said, well, that's what the plan is. We'll go up to this office on this floor. They've got an office up there that will help you find a place. I said, really? Okay, didn't know that. I go up there, and the lady says, oh, well, Dr. Itterman just turned this in. He just remodeled an apartment. It's just about three blocks from campus. Would you be interested? Would I? I went, I looked at it, and I said, I'll take it. Now, it was only three rooms and a bath. And it was filled with cockroaches. Every night, Marilyn and I would come home, we'd flip on the light switch, and we'd do the cockroach two-step. <laughs> Those things took over the place. But it was God's provision. And we were thankful for it. I never will forget Marilyn was got the teapot out and she was filling it up full of water and all of a sudden these little bitty roaches came out, the little steam orifice. She threw that in the air. <laughs> well, we stayed there the entire time we were there. The entire time. It was God's provision. Yeah, there were some raven sandwiches we had to eat, you know. There were some things not so good, things we did, but it was God's provision. God, when He provides, He doesn't always give you the best of the best. He gives you the best for you at the time He gives it. The question is, are you going to be thankful and receive what God gives. Or are you going to be like Elijah who could have said to these ravens, those things are unclean, I'm not eating that, and you can just take that away. I'm not doing it because I'm a man of God. And the Bible says, blah, 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 blah. So therefore, you know, sometimes God teaches us that we need to live by the spirit of the law and not the letter of the law. Some people are so legalistic in their walk with God, it's, it's really repulsing. It's not, it doesn't draw you in. And so that's what we've learned. We've learned that um, don't go by what you see. What I saw was defeat. What I could have done and felt like doing, get in the car, go home and say, Obviously, this is not God's plan because if I was going by what I saw, I would have said this isn't God's way. Let me hurry along here. There's so much more I could say about that, but I think you've uh, got the point. So just remember, there's always going to be a famine in the promised land sooner or later. Just mark it down. Just mark it down.
Number three, third lesson Elijah had to learn, he had to learn to hope in a hopeless situation. To find hope in the hopeless situation. I mean, <clears throat> it looked hopeless. She looked hopeless. That city looked hopeless. Everything about it was hopeless. But Elijah could find hope in the hopeless because he knew that God said, go. Listen, the promised land for you and me is where God says, go. Wherever you go, if God has led you there, that's your promised land. Elijah knew he was sent by God. And Elijah had only two things to go on at this point. First, he had the memory of what God had done in the past for him. And second, he had God's word in the present. The memory of what God had done in the past and God's word for the present. There are times in your life you need to go down memory lane and you need to remember the blessings of God. You need to remember how God took care of you. You need to remember how God provided for you then because He's the same God now. He is the God of yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and He will be the same God that He was yesterday, today, and tomorrow. This lady had faith to believe that what God said through Elijah was true and she acted upon it. Oh, and the blessings that came on the other side of that obedience. And the last of all, last of all, he had to learn that faith has to have obedience. Obedience. You can talk that you have faith, but if you're not believing and acting on it. You see, every time God told somebody to do something, it was not enough for them to say, Amen, thank you Jesus, I got faith in that word. I receive that word. Yeah, amen, blah, blah, blah. And you don't do squat. Faith requires action. And if you're not going to act on it, you're just talking. And God's not moved by your talk, but by your action. You see, the mill barrel didn't multiply until she acted. The oil jar didn't multiply until she acted. Your need is not going to be met until you act on God's Word. And some of you know what God has told you, and you're sitting there debating whether or not you're going to do what you know you ought to do because God has said to do it in His Word, and then you wonder why everything around you is just going to pot. Until you act on what you know you will not receive the blessings that God wants to give you. Faith requires action. Jesus said to the man on the pallet who was lame, he said, what? Rise up and... Now, if the guy had sat there and said, hey, dude, I don't know if you've noticed this, but I can't walk. I'm lame. There's nothing there. can't feel a thing. My muscles have all atrophied. You see, faith doesn't look at what it sees. Faith operates on what it hears from God. And he stood up. Sometimes you're going to have to act before you see the miracle. Test of obedience. She went away and did what God told her, verse 15. And then look at what happened. Verse 16. So there was food every day 
for Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up and the jug of oil did not run dry in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. Yes, Elijah said, do this. But it was really the word of the Lord that he was speaking. And so my friends today, as I close, where are you in your walk with God? How's your faith life? Do you believe, do you believe God's word to be true? Are you still waiting for something to happen? It might be that God is waiting for you to move first. And then when you move, God will do what he said he would do. You say, I want to go to heaven when I die. Hey, wonderful. Who doesn't? But God says, will you move? Will you call on me? Will you ask me to forgive you? Will you take the step of coming to me in faith, believing that when you do, I will do what I promised. I will write your name in the Lamb's book of life. I will cleanse all of your sin, past, present, future. I will make you my own so that you could live with me forever and ever. Do you believe that? You believe that he died, was buried, and rose again. Are you willing to embrace him and what he did for you? If you'll act on that, I promise you, God will do what he said he'll do. But you're not going to heaven just by saying, I want to go. It's more to it. Faith requires an action. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for our time together today. It's been good. I thank you for these moments we've had in the Word. The life of Elijah is just filled with principles of truth. Great, great principles of faith. Lord, it's so wonderful to see what Elijah did, but it's more wonderful to see what you did and how you honor your word. Help us in these days when we may feel like we're living in a very pagan place to realize that as we follow you and do what you say, there are blessings and we can be a blessing to others. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen and amen.